Hey everybody, it's Scott again with the Sengoku series. Um, today I'm coming to you with the last episode of my series on Hideyoshi, uh, but now Toyotomi Hideyoshi. And today we're going to cover the, his downfall, the decline of the Toyotomi clan. Um, so we're really going to cover from the last period of unification, um, around 1590, 1591, after the Hojo and the Date have submitted to the Toyotomi. And specifically, we're going to cover uh, Hideyoshi's invasions of Korea, the Imjin War in the late 1590s, uh, the issue of his success succession, um, which really kind of sealed the fate for the Toyotomi clan in a negative way. And uh, we actually had a, a question, or I had a question, um, from one of our viewers who asked me to talk about the 1597 uh, crucifixion of, uh, I think, 27 no, 26 martyrs, excuse me, of, uh, of Catholics who were killed by, uh, under uh, Hideyoshi's command. Um, so I'm going to start with that today. I didn't mention before, I should have, um, in 1587, after Hideyoshi conquered Kyushu, uh, he issued a prescription against uh, missionaries, Catholic missionaries, converting uh, Japanese people to Christianity. Uh, although this was never really strictly enforced, it was sort of more on paper than anything else. And the fact that he issued it in 87 after taking Kyushu was pretty significant because uh, Nagasaki, um, which had long been sort of the, the center of Western trade activity in Japan, was based in Kyushu. Uh, the Otomo clan, one of the sort of most prominent Japanese clans to convert to Christianity, was based in Kyushu. Uh, so it really is notable that he decided, or Hideyoshi decided, to issue this edict in 87. Uh, but like I said, there was a lot of leniency when it came to its enforcement. Um, you know, it was sort of this, this tightrope between um, encouraging Western trade, which Hideyoshi was certainly not opposed to. Um, there was a lot of benefits, especially in firearms, uh, when it came to trading with the Europeans. Uh, but there was a lot of hostility towards Christianity. Um, you know, there hadn't been any like, Christian uprisings or rebellions um, at all at this point. It was mostly, in fact, the top uh, sort of leading prominent people who were being converted. Um, but something happened in 1596, and it's not particularly well discussed um, in a lot of the popular history out there. But it was the San, San Felipe incident. And basically what happened was a Spanish uh, trading vessel shipwrecked on, uh, uh, in Japan. And the Spanish uh, captain um, of the vessel tried to negotiate rather ham-handedly with Hideyoshi in the, court, in the imperial court. And asked uh, you know, for all the cargo to be returned, um, which included a lot of silver. And, you know, otherwise, you know, you can expect some, a negative reaction from the Spanish Empire, which, you know, you might remember uh, had conquered uh, the Philippines, um, based out of Manila at this point. And so Hideyoshi, uh, in response to this, um, not only refuses to give the silver back, but orders um, Christians at, uh, in Kyushu to be killed, 26 of them, uh, including Europeans as well as some Japanese converts. Uh, and they were crucified in Nagasaki in a mass uh, crucifixion. Uh, and this was, you know, an isolated incident and certainly wasn't part of a trend of harsh treatment towards Christians, uh, at least under Hideyoshi. And uh, according to scholars, uh, it was really about sending a message in 1597 um, that Hideyoshi would not tolerate any sort of militant sectarian activity. Uh, he didn't have a particular you know, hostility towards Christianity or Catholicism. Um, but he remembered how Nobunaga had, deal, had dealt with the um, militant sectarians uh, of the Buddhist nature um, earlier in the Sengoku period. Uh, you know, the, the Iko Iki, um, the Hongonji militants based out of uh, Ishiyama, Hongonji Temple, uh, Nagashima, and so forth. Um, so really it wasn't so much about being opposed to the West or Christianity, but um, opposed to religion mixing with politics and being any kind of threat, uh, political threat to Hideo uh, Hideyoshi's uh, hegemony. 
Um, so that really kind of sums up Sidiyoshi's orientation toward the Christ, toward Christianity and, and the reasoning behind the 1597 massacre of the 26 martyrs. Um, the Tokugawa shogunate, which uh, uh, succeeded uh, Hideyoshi's rule, uh, was a lot more um, harsh. Um, their suppression of Japanese Christians was a lot more uh, draconian and brutal. Um, and if you want to see the movie Silence, which just came out recently by Martin Scorsese, uh, it talks about uh, you know Portuguese um, uh, Franciscans coming over to Japan um, and you know trying to find these isolated communities that have gone underground of Japanese Christians, and just how intent uh, the Tokugawa shogunate was in stamping out, quite literally, um, Catholicism. And it was part of the whole isolationism that the Tokugawa shogunate uh, adopted um, after it took power in 1600. But really for Hideyoshi, um, 1597 and the execution, the crucifixion, was all about uh, sending a really harsh but direct message about opposing his rule, which is something that's going to be sort of a theme throughout this episode. Um, so the invasion of Korea... Uh, the first one started in 1592. Um, some people have theorized that uh, the decision uh, by Hideyoshi to invade Korea um, was a way of draining off, um, you know, all these warriors that he had. You know, he had finally unified Japan. There was no more civil war. He didn't want more civil war, uh, so he sent all his, you know, all this, all these samurai, all these battle-hardened samurai, to Korea to have them. Um, sort of, you know, drain off their energy. But this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, this explanation, the idea that it was some great diversion. Um, because most of the, the, the samurai who went to fight in Korea were, uh, came out of western Japan, which is really where all of his, that is Hideyoshi's, most loyal retainers were based. Uh, guys like uh, uh, Keiro Kiyomasa, Kanbe Kuroda, um, Masanori, Fu Masanori Fukushima, you know, these were, or Fukushima Masanori, you know, these were, these were samurai who were loyal to the Toyotomi, and so if you wanted to, you know, really weaken um, the samurai under his command, he would have made Togawa Ieyasu send a lot of his troops and troops and, and you know, samurai loyal to him off to fight and die in Korea, but he didn't. In fact, uh, Ieyas Ieyasu and the Date clan um, these clans really, you know, sat it out, um, while, uh, a lot of, uh, pro Toyotomi, you know, who were deep in the, in the Toyotomi side, uh, were killed in Korea. Um, so initially the invasion of Korea, um, under Hideyoshi meets with a lot of success. Um, they land in the south and they basically advance all the way to, uh, the northern part of Korea, uh, along the, the Yalu River, which forms sort of a natural boundary with China. And, you know, the plan is to go into Ming, China, and to take it over. And, you know, there was, there's been talk among scholars that, you know, Nobunaga wanted this. Uh, certainly Toyotomi Hideyoshi wanted this. Uh, basically, he wanted to create an Asian empire. He wanted to use all these crack you know, veteran troops that have just, you know, unified Japan, and he wants to send them into Korea and China and take these over. And certainly, you know, Ming China was not at its strongest at this point. Um, it had been dealing with Mongol invasions from the north. Um, it was very weak uh, in this respect. Um, and it really took a lot to sort of muster enough troops to defeat what were basically... Again, you know, samurai who had, after, you know, decades and decades of, of civil conflict, become really quite strong. Um, but Ming China sends reinforcements. They push uh, the Japanese uh, all the way back to southern Korea. And there's a lot of parallels um, between this and sort of the Korean War of the 1950s, where uh, communist North Korea invaded South Korea uh, got all way all <clears throat> got all the way south um, to around uh, Pusan, which is roughly around where um, the Japanese in the 1590s were pushed after the Ming China invasion. Um, 
And then the United States sent troops, the UN troops arrived, and they pushed um, the North Koreans all the way back. Uh, they actually went past the dividing line, the 38th parallel in Korea, which, you know, I guess North Korea going past that border was considered an act of aggression, but the U.S. going past that border and invading North Korea was not considered an act of aggression. Uh, but anyway, MacArthur and the tr U.S. troops um, advanced all the way to the Yalu River, and then Communist China under Mao uh, sent a bunch of its own hardened uh, veterans who had just uh, defeated the Japanese and the nationalist Chinese forces under Chiang Kai-shek, uh, and these troops pushed um, the U.S. all the way back uh, down south to the 30th parallel, uh, sort of creating a stalemate. And a stalemate is exactly what you get in um, the 1590s. Um, you know, the Japanese aren't totally kicked off the Korean Peninsula, but um, they're isolated in the south. Uh, there's basically a truce called in um, 1596. Um, you know, Hideyoshi kind of realizes that it's all over, that his dream of conquering China by way of Korea is, is a pipe dream. Um, but what he doesn't quite expect is how dismissive uh, the Ming court is of him. Uh, they recognize him as a uh, king of Japan. Um, basically, they want to treat him much like the way Ming China cre treated Korea, which is sort of like a pu puppet state, at least nominally. You know, de facto, Korea was independent, and Japan would have been independent under Hideyoshi as well. But, um, you know, it, in sort of, in, in a way of sort of symbolically, Japan would be acknowledging that it was subordinate to the Chinese Empire. Um, Hideyoshi, of course, was very angry about this, and the second invasion of Korea... Uh, in 1597 was more about saving face than actually trying to, again, you know, conquer Korea and conquer China. Um, and in that instance, in the 1597 invasion, um, you know, this, this sort of changing goals was reflected in how utterly decimated Korea was by the second round of invasion. Um, you know, really, it was, it was devastating. I mean, much like the U.S. invasion of North Korea was devastating. You know, Pyongyang was totally destroyed. Um, you know, just sort of scorched earth tactics, really, and just the amount of brutality that was inflicted on the native Korean population. Um, and, you know, it's no secret. You know, I think the reason why, you know, this conflict, the Japanese invasions of Korea during this time, you know, it's collectively referred to as the Imjin War, I-M-G-I-N, and I think the reason why it gets so little acknowledgement in you know popular culture that otherwise goes really in depth into uh, the Sengoku Jidai, the Sengoku period, is that you know just the amount of animosity that exists between really most of Asia, but especially China and Korea towards um, Japan, and sort of the ongoing controversy within Japan about apologizing for things like imperial aggression and, um, you know, atrocities that were committed throughout history. You know, we mostly think of World War II and the Japanese invasion of, of China or, you know, Japan treating Korea like a, like a colony or Korea being a colony of Japan um, in, the, in the 20th century and so on. Um, but this can, a lot of this can be traced back to, you know, the 1590s in this period and really was an awakening of Korean nationalism it was about awakening, you know, Japanese imperial ambitions to go beyond the main islands of Japan into Asia. Uh, so in a ways, it's it's a, it's kind of a prologue towards you know the terrible terrible things that happened in the 20th century, and that's why I kind of think it, it gets a little sort of ignored, um, both you know in video you know popular culture, video games, uh, movies, stuff like this, but also. Um, and I think academic scholarship, there aren't a ton of books that are specifically devoted to um, this conflict. Um, but like I said, one of the main effects, I mean, other than, you know, the huge loss of life, but in terms for what it means for Hideyoshi is that um, his generals are really, um, his, his sort of main clans that support him and the continued rule of the Toyotomi clan in Japan 
are severely weakened and depleted because of these invasions. Uh, it is such a huge drain on the Western daimyo and their samurai. And it, you know, in the meantime, Tokugawa Ieyasu is allowed to build up his strength and political force in Eastern Japan. So collectively, you know, all in all, it was a huge, huge mistake and miscalculation. It wasn't quite as foolhardy as we might think now. And like I said, you know, Ming China was weak. It was in a place where it could potentially be invaded. Um, you know, and this sort of these tensions between Japan and mainland Asia had been building up for, for, for generations. Um, but really, this was one of the long term consequences of, of the of the invasions of Korea was that uh, when Ieyasu finally moved against the Toyotomi in 1600, um, the Western daimyo were not in a position to really um, garner a lot of strength against him. Also, it created a lot of bad blood um, among the Western daimyo. Um, Keito Kiyomasa, uh, again, who I mentioned before, is one of um, you know the top supporters for the Toyotomi initially. Uh, later defected to the eastern side, to Ieyasu's side in the in, in 1600, um, because of a lot of because of animosity towards Ishida Mitsunari, who was one of the chief administrators of uh, uh, of the Toyotomi in Japan, and he had gone to Korea as an administrator, sort of an inspector general, that is to sort of keep up on, you know, waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, by the generals who were leading the Japanese forces in the, in the Korean invasions. And, you know, unsurprisingly, when you're sort of this oversight person, you're going to make some enemies, and Keito Kiyomasa was one of those people, as well as some others, um, including, including Fukushima Mitsunari, uh, Masanori, who, again, you know, he was also one of those who turned against the Toyotomi and sided with Ieyasu in 1600. Uh, so that was another side effect of these invasions. <clears throat> but really, what really did in the Toyotomi clan was a succession crisis. And really, Hideyoshi's attempts to avoid a succession crisis are kind of what uh, sabotaged the whole um, project of his. Of his. Um, now, I've mentioned before Hideyoshi was a philanderer. He was kind of a lush. He loved the fine arts. He loved culture. But he also loved to drink. He loved the ladies. Um... But quite uh, inf infamously, he, he was not very good at siring children. Um, he did take as a concubine um, a woman by the name of Chacha. Uh, she was a daughter of Azai Nagamasa and Oichi, so she was technically the niece of Oda Nobunaga. Uh, after the Azai were destroyed um, by, by the Oda, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi took uh, Cha Cha as you know as a concubine, uh, and she produced uh, two children for him. Um, the first was a child named uh, Surumatsu. Uh, he was born in 1589, uh, but then died in 1591. Uh, in 1591, uh, Hideyoshi lost his stepbrother Hidenaga, who had been with him from the early days, uh, serving under the Oda. Uh, he was, you know, pretty well respected. He was, uh, you know, a, a trusted assistant, you know, being of blood to Hideyoshi. And when he died, he lost a potential successor in, in Hidenaga. Um, also in 1591, I want to mention um, the sudden and unexpected death of Rikyu, uh, Sen no Rikyu, who is considered one of the, you know, founding fathers of the tea ceremony. Um, like I said, Hideyoshi patronized the, uh, the arts the, and culture, um, and that included the tea ceremony. Um, the Grand Kitano uh, Tea Ceremony, which was held, I believe, in 87, 1587, was one of the major moments under Hideyoshi. Um, and so he, was, he patronized uh, Rikyu, um, and then suddenly in 1591, he ordered Rikyu to commit suicide. And, you know, sent him into exile first to Sakai and then had him commit suicide. And there's been a lot of speculation as to why this happened, uh, because suddenly he was in the good graces, he was being patronized, and then suddenly he's made to kill himself. And, you know, one of the most popular theories you'll read is that he was on this moderate faction within the Hideyoshi upper, upper, upper echelon, 
and that he advocated peace and moderation in dealing with you know the Hojo and the Date uh, rather than making them submit, which doesn't make much sense. You know, uh, Mary Berry in her biography of Hideyoshi uh, dismisses this as well as other explanations that, for example, he had a statue carved and that he was making himself a rival to Hideyoshi or that, um, you know, and, and all these kind of intrigues, these kind of plots that have been invented to explain why Hideyoshi had him killed. Um, and basically her theory is that it was just an arbitrary act of strength to kind of warn anyone thinking of moving against uh, Hideyoshi and the Toyotomi clan, you know, this is the kind of power I have. And the fact that it came so late in 91, you know, after the death of his son, Suramatsu, the death of his stepbrother, Hidenaga, you know, there's the, the future of the Toyotomi clan is looking very precarious. And then in 93, Hideyoshi gets another son, Hideyori, who's again also both born to Chacha, who's also known as Lady Yodo, um, because uh, she she lived in, in Yodo, Yodo Castle for a number of years, and that's where she had these these, these boys. So Hideyori's born in 15... Um, 93. Sorry, I got my notes over here. Um, in the meantime, Hideyoshi had named his nephew, the son of Hidenaga, or rather, no, I don't think that's right. Uh, it was the son of one of his sisters, uh, Hidesugu, to be his heir. And so his nephew, Hidesugu, uh, it's pretty clear that he wasn't a great guy. Um, you know, Hideyoshi clearly held off on naming him as his heir and successor even though he was a right, you know, about the right age in, in his 20s. Um, and there's a lot of accounts that he was, you know, not a great leader, not a great commander. Uh, Louis Freud, um, the, the missionary who wrote a lot about Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi, uh, describes Hidesugu as being very sadistic, as almost like one of these, you know, the worst of the worst when it comes to Roman emperors like Caligula, you know, cutting up, having women cut up just to see their, their body parts and putting people to death just for his own amusement. You know, how much we really want to believe that is up in the air. But anyway, Hidesugu had been named the heir and successor to Hideyoshi um, after the death of his son and the death of his brother in 91. Um, when Hideyori comes along in 93, uh, Hidesugu is... Um, eventually exiled in, in 1595 to Mount Koya, where he's made to commit suicide. Uh, his family members, who uh, are still in the capital in Kyoto, are also publicly executed, um, including several very young children. Um, and again, this is one considered one of the most you know brutal acts that Hideyoshi commits in his later years. Um, and again, it's it's meant to stop the succession crisis. He's saying very clearly, look, here's all the other potential claimants to succeed me. Um, you know, my, my, my first son has died. My stepbrother has died. Um, my nephew was originally going to be my successor, but now he's dead and all his relatives are dead. Hideyori, my son, my infant son, I'm putting, I'm going all in on him. <laughs> you know, reaching maturity and, and taking over. And, I mean, we don't really know for exactly, you know, why he was, you know, what his emotional attitude was towards Hidesugu and why, you know, he exiled him, killed him, and went with an infant son over Hidesugu. Um, I mean, that lends some credence, I believe, to those, you know, the ideas that he, Hidesugu was not an ideal person to have ruled Japan after Hideyoshi. Um, but man, he must have been pretty bad for Hideyoshi to go all in with a baby, an infant, really. Um, and I think, you know, Hideyoshi wasn't stupid. He knew this. And when he was on his deathbed in 1598, he, he called a council of five elders, which included Ieyasu, um, Yukida Hidie, um, Mori Teruboto, I believe, yes. Um, Tokugawa Ieyasu, I already mentioned him, uh, Meida Toshiie, and he made them swear 
you know, a north of loyalty to, you know, this infant child, to the Yori, and really it sort of was believed that Meta Toshie was sort of the glue that held this rather fragile agreement together, and as soon as he died in 1599, the following year, that's when Iyasu made his move, um, ostensibly against uh, the Uyasuji. Uyasuji Kaidakasu had been one, another one of the five regions. Um, but really, you know, it was his play for power that he ultimately won uh, against the, the people who stayed loyal to the Toyotomi. You know, obviously Hideyori, being a kid, did not lead the Toyotomi coalition against Ieyasu in 1600. Um, he pretty much stayed under the care of his mom, his mother, uh, Lady Yodo, uh, in, in Osaka, in Osaka Castle, which is, you know, the castle that Hide, uh, Hideyoshi had built up um, during, you know, sort of the, the, the pinnacle of his rule. Um, and he's basically, he stays there. Um, so after Sekigahara, after the big battle where Ieyasu defeats the Ishida Mutsunari, Ishida Mutsunari, Ishida Mutsunari, and the forces, the Western army, the forces loyal to the Toyotomi, um, you know, Hideyori lives on as sort of a as living symbol for all the people who remain loyal to the Toyotomi and are opposed to the Tokugawa, Tokugawa shogunate. Um, and this goes on for about 15 years, from 1600 to, I believe, 1615. Um, you know, Hideyori lives on. Um, uh, and then, you know, a number of samurai, um, most famously uh, Sonata uh, Yukimura, you know, rallied to him in Osaka. There's a number, there's two sieges of Osaka led by uh, the Tokugawa. The second one um, ultimately brings down the castle and Hideyori is killed along with his mother and Sonata Yukimura and so on. And that's really the end of the Toyotomi. Um, Hideyoshi was deified after his death. Um, uh, he uh, basically, you know, he became a god. And he was one of the very few who was actually, you know, deified, who was never an emperor, who be, who was, you know, turned into a god after his death. Um, but of course, you know, worship of him as a, as a spirit, as a, as a god figure was heavily suppressed after the Tokugawa shogunate took over. Um, and also, it's, it's something that I want to mention is, you might hear about these, I forget the Japanese term for it, but they're called ear mounds, or at least there's one ear mound um, outside of a temple dedicated to Hideyoshi. And it was the ears and noses collected in Korea during the second Korean invasion, which again was not about conquering Korea or China, but purely about inflicting suffering on the Korean people. So samurai who would often take heads in battles, battle would also take noses and ears. And um, the ones taken from Korea uh, were interred in this mound. Um, that, to my knowledge, still exists. Although most Japanese people don't know about it, obviously most Korean people know about its existence. Uh, the Japanese kind of just choose to ignore that part of their history. Um, so that about wraps it all up um, for my Hideyoshi videos. Um, sort of to kind of give my appraisal of him as a ruler... You know, he, you know, the whole thing about coming from his humble origins and becoming, you know, sort of the supreme power in, in Japan. Uh, you know, I should mention that, you know, he was imperial regent. He was the Kampaku until he uh, made Hiyasugu his heir um, in uh, 1581 or so. Uh, then he became the Taiko. He became the retired regent and Hiyasugu became Kampaku, the actual region, although Hideyoshi held on to his power. So anyway, from Hideyoshi to come from peasant stock to this position of, you know, retired imperial regent uh, was incredible. He was remarkable. Um, he clearly, um, I, you know, got to where he was based on his skills, his talent, and the initiative he showed after Nobunaga's assassination in 1582. The land surveys, um, the, the, sword, the great sword hunt, um, you know, the, the edict about, uh, you know, you're either a commoner or you're a samurai, you can't be both. Um, and of course, the, you know, the actual unification of Japan were all these huge accomplishments that he did. You know, clearly none of it would have been possible without the momentum created by Oda Nobunaga. Um, but he really put the finishing touches on a stable, unified Japan. Um, in terms of building 
a structure, a government structure that would have kept his family alive and well going on in the future, you know, he has to get a failing grade. <clears throat> you know, part of this was, you know, not being able to sire a large number of, of sons, um, which, you know, if the guy was impotent or whatever, if, you know, there was something going on, like, we'll never know for ex exactly why this was the case, but, um, you know, there was a lot of time where he could have adopted a more, he could have adopted an heir from among his really talented retainers, but he never did. Um, and, you know, when it finally came time to make a decision and, and pick a definite successor, you know, I think he went, he made him a, I mean, unless Hidesugu was, like, the worst of the worst, like a cartoon villain, or, you know, like one of these guys in, in these, you know, made-up samurai movies who's just pure, pure evil, like 13 Assassins evil, I don't see why he would go with Hideyori, his infant son, over Hidesugu. I guess he just had a lot more faith in sort of the traditional feudal relationship between a daimyo and his vassals. And that's basically what he had created was that at the national level. But after having lived through the Sengoku period, which was all about vassals overthrowing their lords and the low overtaking the high, including, you know, him coming from the lowest of the low and becoming one of the highest of the high, I don't know where that, that trust really came from. I guess he maybe just thought that people were tired of war and that, you know, finally I've achieved unification and that's the end. Um, but I don't, you know... He trusted Ieyasu, which is a rookie mistake, just classic error on his part, because as soon as Ieyasu saw his opportunity, he, he made it, he went for it, and he took it, and he won. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you have to give a lot of acknowledgement to Hideyoshi for, for reaching the point that he did, even if he wasn't able um, to really make a lasting legacy for his, his, his bloodline. Um... And other than you know, the secession thing, I mean, obviously the Korean invasion was a mistake. Um, I think that kind of goes without saying. Um, I mean, at least, you know, the, the, the second one served no real purpose other than saving face. Um, the first one, you could maybe excuse for, you know, I mean, China was in a weak position, Korea was a tempting target, but... Um, there really was no point of the second invasion in 1597 other than to make the Koreans suffer. Um, and the Christianity thing, you know, I, again, I think he was just treating Catholic missionaries as a potential threat, just as he, Oda Nobunaga considered the monks of Mount Hiei or the Ikioiki to be a threat to him, to his power. Um, so the next series of videos, I'm going to do Tokugawa Ieyasu and sort of chart his rise to power, his patience, uh, waiting for the right opportunities to strike, and knowing how when to fold them, when to, when to hold them. Um, and I'm also working on an officer directory based on the Nobu's, Nobunaga's Ambition Games, which um, I'm using biographical information from the Samurai Archives website, um, as well as um, Stephen Turnbull's books. Um, Obviously, I want to, you know, I'm going to give credit where credit is due and, and not try to plagiarize like, you know, maybe a certain Wikipedia is famous for. Um, but yeah, so look, for, look, look forward to that coming out soon, um, at least in the early stages. Um, but hopefully I'll see you again soon. I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, I welcome feedback and comments either here on this video on YouTube or on the Samurai Cars Archives forum. And as always, big shout out to the Samurai Archives people. Uh, donate to their Patreon, keep the podcast going, um, and support them um, by bu buying books through the Amazon bookstore link on their page. So, um, thank you. Bye.